Thank you, Daniele, and thank you, Thilo, and other organizers for inviting me to do this. Uh, I will admit that these online talks are not my favorite thing. I prefer a live audience. So the request to Daniele to field questions during the talk is to simulate as best I can uh, the experience of actually interacting with you all. So please feel free to ask questions. So as Daniele said, uh, the talk is really gonna be about a biological ring attractor or at least a biological network that we think is well approximated as a ring attractor. Now, many of you I think are sort of familiar with ring attractors from a mathematical side, from the theoretical side of things, uh, a dynamical system which has this lovely property that if you have a network of nodes in the abstract sense, uh, you can stabilize activity at any one of those nodes. Whoops, how did that happen? There we go. Uh, stabilize activity at any one of those nodes and then also flexibly sort of move it in either direction. So a se seemingly simple property of a network where you just can have any node be active at any given time and be stable in that activity pattern, but it can, it's multi-stable and can go around. So this simple little construct is actually quite useful and has many intriguing little properties. So this, this general schema fits very well um, with you know, a wide range of theoretical work that have come from many labs, uh, you know, I'm Sampolinsky, but a whole bunch of other people as well. And it has been used in particular for something called head direction cells. And it started out in rodents and mammals where head direction cells um, are, are, have been recorded uh, from Jeff Tobey and others. And so the key thing with these neurons is that if the rodent is in a virtual environment or a real environment uh, and happens to have a cue at some particular part of that environment or many cues at some particular part of the environment, if you happen to record from certain thalamic areas on many areas besides, certain neurons have response properties that are very specific in their tuning to the head direction of the animal. So if, if I were a rodent in this case, I mean, humans have head direction cells too, I'm sure. So the idea is if I'm pointed in this direction, maybe there's one group of neurons that's active. If I turn like this, there's a different group of neurons that turn like this, a different group of neurons and so on and so forth. And so each cell might have a tuning like this, uh, fire the most for a particular um, head direction. And then there'd be a whole network of cells that would do the same thing for different directions. And the, the entire study, uh, the theoretical study has been about how you arrange a set of neurons, what kinds of connectivity patterns you'd give them to actually allow this network to function like this, where different neurons would be tuned to different directions. And as you turn, uh, activity would smoothly move from one side to the other to kind of match, basically a neural compass, right? And so what we've been doing in, in my lab is studying this in, in an insect. And so insects have head direction cell or cells very similar to head direction cells as well. And this isn't just something that's true for the fly, although that's what I'll be talking about. So locusts have it, grasshoppers, uh, in Uwe Holmberg's lab has shown that, um, cockroaches have it, Roy Ritzman's lab has shown that, um, you know, monarch butterflies have it. And of course they make really long range navigational, uh, you know, I don't know, masterpieces going from North America to a specific grove in Mexico. So there's a lot of behavioral uh, marvels in, in the insect kingdom that you, you kind of think, well, how do they navigate? And, and we think that these kinds of networks are fundamental to how they get head direction. And so we study it in the fly. The fly is super convenient because of all the genetic tools that it offers us. And you'll see examples of how we use them in a little while. Um, but here's kind of the vanilla version. Uh, it's, it's kind of a very uh, stripped down schematic of the fly brain. Um, so this would be the eyes. Um, there's visual information coming in through here, but the region of the brain that we focus on is right in the center. It's called the central complex. And the particular part of the brain that I will be focused a lot on is something called the ellipsoid body, this little donut shaped structure uh, right there. And this is an actual image in our biology um, where what you're seeing is these different neurons. This is all of one particular type. It's called an EPG neuron for reasons that we don't need to get into yet. Um, but essentially they arborize in the ellipsoid body and they have a very particular arbor pattern, which you'll see is kind of not dissimilar in some ways from this. So it really is that these neurons arborize and, and when I keep saying arborize, I mean the dendrites and axons kind of arborize in little um, sectors of um, the ellipsoid body. So they carve up this donut amongst themselves. This is just a stochastic labeling from Tanya Wolf uh, that highlights that. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to watch what happens in these neurons when we put calcium indicators, genetically encoded calcium indicators that are restricted to just this neural population. There's many other neuron types that are in the ellipsoid body. We restrict to just this. And what we're going to do in this case, Johannes Zelig, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time and is now a Max Planck group leader in Bonn, um, what he did was put a fly on the ball. So this is a virtual reality setup, but we've, for the moment, there we've blacked out the arena. So all it can see is darkness. We've even blacked out its eyes. So really it can't see much. And so it's in pitch darkness, it's on a ball and we're tracking the ball rotations. And what I want you to watch is what happens to the calcium activity in, these, in this population of neurons as the fly does its thing, okay? So I should say that on the plot here below, what we're tracking is the population vector average of the activity, essentially um, what is the direction of that vector that you're seeing that little bump of activity develop there and move around, what the direction of that is relative to the blue line, which is the actual rotation of the ball, accumulated rotation of the ball. So hopefully you're pretty convinced that two things are true here. One is that when the fly sort of stands still for a while, as it does right now, no, right now the video is stopped, but uh, in general, in, in the live video, when the fly is standing still for a while, the activity persisted. Uh, it doesn't always persist at the same level. Sometimes the, the level drops, often the level drops, but also when the fly turns, rotates in darkness, the activity sort of follows that pattern. And so that sets up the fundamental puzzle which is how do you get a head direction like system that works in darkness? And of course, you know, I, the reason the talk is titled as it is, is because we think that it has a lot to do with this um, ring attractor. So I don't know why my slides are drifting back. I'm sorry for that. Um, so the question we pose then is how do you actually get a bump to move around in darkness in such a way, and this is the important part, that you integrate pretty well. So essentially you're doing a very good angular integration for this compass to work well enough that you know, as the fly rotates by 360 degrees, the bump keeps pace pretty well. It's not perfect, I should say. So quantitatively looking at it, it does drift of course, as you would drift if you were blindfolded and left in a room. So how does it work? Well, it turns out that the answer is actually in the anatomy, in the wiring of the system, the structure of the system in a very explicit way. So we're gonna look at this ellipsoid body, this structure now through the, the lens of electron microscopy. And so this is a collaboration between Janelia's Fly EM team and Google um, who did the autom who helped with the automatic reconstruction of these neurons. Uh, Harold Hess's lab actually did the uh, electron microscopy for it. So it's a chunk of brain tissue that's a large percentage of the central brain. Um, and we call it the hemi brain because it's not the full brain. And what you're seeing here is the EPG neurons that I told you about. These are literally the EPG neurons of a, of a particular fly. And so we're gonna look through, and, and what you'll notice is um, there's one set of neurons that has outputs in this other structure called the protocerebral bridge. So this is how the EPGs get their name. Lipsoid body is the E and protocerebral bridge is the T. So these neurons send arbors up there. There's another set of neurons that they make synapses with, which we can literally see now in electron microscopy resolution, synaptic resolution. And so they pick up their input then they come back, but they come back with an offset. And you'll see that again and again. So this is another EPG neuron. It is connected to that other neuron, which is called a PEN neuron, protocerebral bridge to ellipsoid body. That's the P and the E. And this guy goes back up and then he goes, you, you'll see there's a regular shift going on. That's a clockwise shift in this schema, right? but this is real biology now. You're actually looking at these neurons again, another connection. This is another EPG neuron, the blue one, and it goes back up to the other column in the protocerebral bridge. And so there's this little offset thing that's going on and it happens the other direction as well, except now we're talking about the other part of the protocerebral bridge. So again, hopefully what you see is a pattern where you can kind of walk in one direction or the other direction. So if you think about it, what this can, potentially give you is if the EPG neurons carry a bump of activity, well, this would be one way to move it in, let's say the counterclockwise direction would be if this side of the protocerebral bridge were to be activated just a little bit, you kind of go up there, come back to the uh, counterclockwise side, go up there, come back to the counterclockwise side and so on. If this side were activated, you would move in the other direction, right? So that is the general idea with how, you know, conceptually this might work. So I'm gonna leave the eye candy for later, we'll come back to it. 
and, and take you to schematics again. And so again, here's the PEN neurons relative to the EPG neurons. The EPG neurons from this area of the ellipsoid body might go to these particular columns of this other structure called the bridge, the protocerebral bridge. The PEN neurons, which come back, this is the recurrent connection, they come back with an offset. So if you're on this side, you're offset to the clockwise side. If you're on this side, you're offset to the counterclockwise side. So in principle, if you wanted to kind of move, if every time the fly turned this direction and you wanted the compass to kind of, uh, the compass needle to shift, you would just want this side of the protocerebral bridge activated. If you wanted on the other hand, to turn, the, when the fly turned the other direction, if you wanted the compass to move in the other direction, well, you'd want this side of the protocerebral bridge to be activated. So Stephanie Wigner in the lab actually tried to look at this using electrophysiology. So she did whole cell patch clamp recordings from these ell ellipsoid body neurons and asked if indeed the PEN neurons specialize in tuning to one or the other direction based on which side of the protocerebral bridge they're from. Okay, so that's what she was looking at. And indeed, she found that uh, looking at both spiking and subthreshold activity, there was such tuning. That is, depending on which side you were uh, recording from or she was recording from, if she was recording from these, the blue side of neurons, so uh, this part of the protocerebral bridge, these neurons would have a clear angular velocity tuning preference for these negative velocities. If she was recording from the right side of the protocerebral bridge, in this case, the right side, she would find a different kind of tuning and, and they would have um, you know, a tuning to the other side. Uh, so basically it turns to one side or turns to the other side. So what this gives you now is in theory, the ability to say, well, every time the fly turns one way, you get, uh, you get input to the, just the right side of the ellipsoid body EPG neurons to shift the bump one way, if you're turning the other way to the other side, okay? Now you'll notice there's actually quite a bit of uh, what seems like variability at these velocities, at these high velocities. So what's going on there? I mean, why isn't it a tight tuning curve? For this, we need to go back to the idea that these guys are actually getting input, not just of angular velocity, but also of EPG inputs, heading input. So it's a combination of this head direction input and rotational input. So if you put the two together, which we did here, what you get back then is a 2D plot where you can look at the angular velocity tuning for the peak heading. And that of course is, is a tight curve, but if you sum it, average it over the entire heading space, then you get the full variability that you see uh, below in these curves. So again, hopefully that makes sense. The idea again is these PEN neurons, which are recurrently looped back with an offset to the EPG neurons, specialize in tuning to velocity in one or the other direction. And together, this entire system can give you something where uh, the bump can be shifted one way or the other, yeah? So this Next. is something that Hervé Rouault, um, who at the time was the research associate at Genelia, he, he's now a group leader in Marseille. Um, so Hervé Rouault formalized in a model. And so it was a ring attractor model, uh, in this case, discrete ring attractor model with one additional tweak, uh, which is inhibition. So of course, in order for the ring attractor to work and stabilize and have only one bump, we need inhibition in the picture. And so he found that it was quite easy to take um, the basic connectivity schema that we had at the time, which was actually inspired not by electron microscopy, which we didn't have at the time, but light microscopy. So he constructed a little matrix with uh, connections between these compass neurons, the angular velocity neurons, and a healthy dose of uh, near uniform inhibition. And what he could get back was activity that looked pretty good. I mean, so basically he could simulate to a reasonable extent um, the actual heading input, I'm uh, sorry, the actual uh, angular velocity integration by just sending in angular velocity inputs. So it's essentially realistic inputs, uh, input into this ring attractor, and it would track velocity pretty well. And so, Next. yes, question. I think I'm, I may have picked a couple of questions. Uh, sure. That, and you can address them later if you think you will do that at some point. Yep. So Peter Thomas is asking, uh, is saying basically walking flies navigate in 2D, but flying flies navigate in 3D. So do flies have a spatial navigation circuit I mean, with the topology of a sphere? So excellent question. I mean, is this is usually a question I get from people who love the bat work from uh, <laughs> Nakamulanovsky, Arseny Finkelstein and others. Um, we think that the fly does do things in 3D, even when it walks, it can be upside down. It often spends its time upside down. So at some level, there has to be something that tells it where it is in 3D and we don't know where that is and we don't have a clue yet. So right now we have this donut and you can come up with a toroidal coordinate system imaginatively through it. We don't think that's the case, but um, 
you know, we think that the fly has a different solution potentially than that, but we don't know yet. We really don't know. And very briefly, how many neurons are there in the ellipsoid body? So the ellipsoid body as a whole has many, many neurons. Of these, of this particular type, there's, you can say roughly about 48 to 50 of these kinds of neurons, these EPG neurons, and a similar-ish number for the PEN neurons. Okay. So Thank you. I'll we'll keep, we'll keep other questions for later. Sure, that sounds good. So uh, Hervé could get this model to simulate you know, pretty well what the EPG neurons were doing. Um, now, more recently, Dan Turner Evans in the lab basically took uh, electron microscopy data, combined it with RNA sequencing data. So uh, I'll explain why we need both of these. EM electron microscopy will give you the synapses, you know, who's connected to who. But uh, until recently, uh, work from Jan Funke suggested that maybe you can even derive uh, what the neurotransmitter is based on some features of the synapse. But in general, it's very hard to know what the sign of those synapses are. Is it a positive or a negative sign? So you just know that they're connected. And so Dan, in addition to that, um, led an effort to actually do RNA sequencing to figure out what are the neurotransmitters, what are the receptors, and then actually derive this matrix um, that is in potential, I mean, in theory, matchable to this uh, theoretical matrix. And so we have a sense that many features of what was in Airways model are actually pretty accurate, that, that you know, this network really does look kind of like this. And so um, this is something that we're still puzzling over. And, and you, know, you can read about uh, Dan's work uh, in the paper if you like. Um, but this is something that there's many puzzles here. And so one of the little puzzles that his work has raised is, well, um, if one views this network purely as a ring attractor and as nothing else, which you shouldn't, but let's say you did, uh, there's many more neuron types than you might need. There's many ways to close the loop. There's many recurrent loops. Uh, and further, there's all kinds of connectivity at the local level within the ellipsoid body. So it's not just this big loop that goes up and back with an offset. There's lots of interconnections inside this. So is that to smooth the bump? Is that to make it more continuous? We don't know at the moment. Um, you know, we certainly think of this as the discretization is imposed by these units. There's nine of these units. And so, you know, Marcella Norman, uh, who's a uh, fantastic theorist in Anne Hermanstead's lab, uh, had a cosine talk, which I encourage you to watch, where she was looking at, well, how do you take a discrete set of units and get back something that actually behaves pretty well, integrates pretty linearly when injected with velocity? So that's something that, you know, is a puzzler for us. I mean, normally when you think in mammals, you think millions of neurons and so on. Here we're talking about a small network with tens of neurons that accomplishes the same thing. And it's a puzzle for us to think of how that's done. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna switch gear. Um, so the, the specific thing I'm gonna look at now is this particular network also works with visual inputs. So not just in darkness, but with visual inputs. So in this case, the fly is now embedded in a VR arena that surrounds it. Um, there's visual features on the arena. And as you can see, the bump locks to them just fine. I don't even need to show you the plots here for you to realize that it's a really tight locking. The correlations are often literally one. I'm gonna let it play a bit. Again, you should imagine this is all around the fly, not just a flat plate in front. That's just for convenience. And so the question we were interested in more recently is, well, how does this work that you register both, um, both kinds of input to the same compass? How do you keep things consistent so that when you rotate your head, let's say by 30 degrees uh, with your eyes shut, the visual experience you get at the end of that 30 degrees in some sense shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't displace the bump. So essentially the scene should get mapped on to this compass representation. And how does that mapping happen? Because obviously the fly doesn't just operate in one visual scene, neither do you. You operate in many different visual scenes. And so the question was, if you take two, uh, and I call these naturalistic scenes for the fly because these are from Janelia and Janelia has a lot of flies inside the building anyway, um, and some perhaps escape, but anyway. So this is uh, you know, just an iPhone panorama. Uh, and if you look at the scene, you need to be able to find your heading, head direction in this scene, as well as the one below, which is also from, from the woods uh, behind me. And so the question is, how does that do that? How does the flight do that? How does the network do that? And so this is something Sun Tzu Kim, uh, who's now uh, recently, uh, for a year now, been at, uh, a professor at UC Santa Barbara, but at the time was a postdoc in the lab. He explored with a bunch of fantastic theorist colleagues, um, Anne Hermanstead, Sandra Romani, and Larry. And Larry is, is uh, the main person to blame, along with Eve Marder, for the early Brandeis switch from numerical simulations and math works and whatever to, uh, to, to neuroscience. So blame him for everything you don't like about this talk effectively. Um, but anyway, so, so we explored this uh, with this 
fabulous uh, collaboration. And what we explored was if you take this scene and sort of convert it, you make it a very bitty sort of uh, image now, low resolution image, present it to the fly. And in this case, it's a flying fly. So, um, you know, you can introduce flight into the mix and the flight compass works just fine as well. So here's the visual scene mapped all around the fly. Uh, Sung Su is now doing two photon imaging. You can see the bump. Um, the reason it's not as vividly, beautifully uh, visible as in the walking case is actually not to do with flight versus walking. It's actually because in these experiments, we're doing something else. And for that, he needs to keep the laser intensity low and the something else will become clear shortly. So in this more complex visual scene with many bright and dark spots, uh, the bump tracks just fine. Again, the correlations tend to be near one. So this is one visual scene. Um, we can sort of analyze how good this correlation is or how well it's tracking by just, again, computing the population vector average. So we break up the ellipsoid body into 16 segments like this. Um, we compute what the population vector average is of activity in that. And you're gonna see it frequently now plotted like this. So this is one time instant. The wedges go from one through 16 and we're tracking activity and that's kind of the PVA, the mean activity uh, level, the mean orientation that we're extracting from it. So if one looks at this now, um, what you're looking at is activity on, uh, in, in black, that's a black line. Hopefully you can see it on your screens as well. Um, and red is the orientation, the actual, I mean, the virtual orientation in this arena. And you can see it's a very good match. But now what if Sung Su changes the scene? What happens then? So when he presents the fly with a different scene, the fly once again, you know, the compass locks on to this and indeed it works fine. The correlation is great again, but you'll notice that there's this offset. You shouldn't be surprised by the offset because the offset in some sense is arbitrary. There's a network of neurons, it's a compass uh, in one visual scene, you know, the north of the compass, it's not a ge you know, a geographical north, but the north of the compass might be here. It might tether to certain parts of the visual scene, um, but in a different setting, in a different scene, you might have you know, the north point somewhere else. So the offset isn't a big surprise. What's cool though, is if you compare what happens in the two scenes and you use the same, you, know, you follow the same network when the fly is exposed to these two scenes, what you get is a pretty uniform distribution of offsets. It's all over the place as you go from you know, the, what we call the forest scene to the open space scene, the offsets between where the compass is um, north might be and what the scene is, you know, that can vary and it's uniform. So it's not hardwired in. This is not a network where it's just like, yeah, you have these visual connections, they, the cues come here and, you know, they lock on to certain parts of the compass and that's what lights up. It's not, it's not that, it's not a retinotopic map. It's, it's, it's actually more flexible than that. And that's emphasized by one particular thing, which is if you present the same scene, however, so let's say that you present the forest scene, the open space scene, and you come back to the forest scene or the open space scene, the forest scene, and you come back to the open space scene. In that case, the difference in the offset is actually pretty close to zero. So in general, these scenes are really mapped on to this compass and it can potentially hold multiple scenes in it. Not maybe too many, but still it can hold multiple scenes in it. So the question then becomes, how do you get scene mapping onto the compass? And so this is where we need to go to the visual inputs uh, to the compass. And so these are a set of neurons that we call ring neurons. And again, we're gonna focus in on, on uh, this little donut in the middle of the fly brain. And again, we're gonna take you to EM, electron microscopy. Uh, and this time we're gonna go, this is where I left you last time. You know, these were the PEN neurons. These were the ones that provided angular velocity input to shift the bump. But now we're gonna go to a different set of uh, neurons that actually provide the visual inputs. And these come from the eye. Um, you know, the pathway comes from the eye all the way through regions that are, you know, I don't have to tell you about, but this particular region I'll mention is the bulb. So input comes in uh, from the photoreceptors all the way down into the central complex. And these ring neurons, you'll note a single neuron goes all the way around, but there's a whole population of these neurons. So this entire population that's bringing visual input, each individual in principle synapses onto every single compass neuron. Each individual one of these ring neurons synapses onto every EPG or compass neuron in the whole ring. Okay, so it's a beautiful network. Um, why would it be like that? And so um, if you look at these ring neurons though, you get kind of a reason why it might be like that. Each of these ring neurons, which you'll see shortly now in a movie, if we were to image those ring neurons or, or specifically their boutons, these, uh, I mean, not the boutons, their uh, dendrites in, in the bulb in, these, in this particular arbor, each of these now you can sort of see have a particular receptive field. 
And in this case, again, the arena is around the fly. We're showing it a very simple pattern. In other work, we've looked at it uh, and we've realized that in fact, there's, uh, it's a spatiotemporal filter. It's not just a simple receptive field, but for simplicity, this does the trick. You'll see that the, the lower neurons are not activated yet, but will get activated as this bar moves to a lower position. So essentially you can imagine the world, you know, features in the world being mapped on, there you go, features in the world being mapped on to this um, set of neurons, the so-called ring neurons. And what you get from this entire set is something that looks like this. Again, there's more complexity to this, which we've explored with, uh, uh, with collaborators and other people have explored as well. But for the purposes of the stock, consider them kind of like simple cells. I mean, basically large simple cell receptive fields uh, spread out across uh, the visual field of the fly. Okay, so you have visual inputs coming in through these ring neurons. The ring neurons, each individual goes throughout the ellipsoid body, throughout the compass, synapsing onto presumably all the compass neurons. We actually know from EM now that it literally is all the compass neurons. So if, let's look at the, pers pers uh, the perspective of a single compass neuron. So that single compass neuron in this case, I think I picked this one uh, that's over here. It might have synaptic weights onto it from all these visual ring neurons, but let's just take the green guy, that's this one. And it has a particular weight. The other ring neuron, that's this purple one, might have a given weight onto it as well. But if you look at it as a population, it's an all to all mapping. So there's a map from all these ring neurons that are feature detectors to all the compass neurons. And so if you think about what might happen if you have say a single visual cue, so forget the complex environment and just restrict it now to a single visual bar. If that bar hits the neurons um, receptor field in the sweet spot, that neuron is gonna be active. Um, if it hits another neuron over here, that neuron is gonna be active. If we want the visual scene, in this case, just a single cue and its positions all around the fly to be mapped on perfectly to the compass, what you'd want is this matrix should convert and you should get a diagonal like this, right? So essentially, any, if we arrange the ring neurons by receptive field, by azimuthal uh, arrangement of receptive fields, depending on which one's activated, you want a specific set of compass neurons to be activated so that it's a smooth mapping all the way around. So how could you get this mapping? So this is something that uh, formed the core of uh, what we were exploring with, with uh, Sang Su and our collaborators. And so the idea was simple. It was basically um, to, to assume, which we know is true that uh, angular velocity inputs shift the bump around in the absence of visual input, just angular velocity inputs shift the bump around. Um, these visual inputs that coincide when the bump is at a particular place, um, you know, those particular inputs are the ones that we think get you know, either amplified or, or suppressed. So let's say that you have a simple plasticity rule that's just heavy and like, and every time a ring neuron is active with the bump in a particular place, the weights selectively, um, let's say drop in, in those particular points. And so these are inhibitory neurons. And so over time, you convert that matrix into something like a diagonal structure, as long as the fly explored enough of space to activate its different ring neurons, um, you know, maybe throughout the compass's visual field, as long as the bump went to enough places around this ellipsoid body, just through sheer overlap, through experience dependent plasticity in this case, um, you'd get through simple Hebbian rules, you'd get something that basically transforms, that maps the world onto this. So this is, Related to, I mean, I'm sure many of you are thinking of uh, all kinds of plasticity rules. They, they might all work. Um, there's, you know, links to Kohonen networks, etc. But bottom line, Sang Su implemented this a few different ways, and he found that indeed he could get uh, this network to behave much like the fly's network behaves. When basically all he had to assume was ring neurons. Bring, I mean, some ring neurons. Uh, in this case, I, I should it's very important to specify, are not visual. So there are other sensory modalities that are around as well, but let's just focus on the visual. If the visual ring neurons, some particular ones are active at a given time when the bump is at a particular place, drop the weights there. If a different one is active when the bump is somewhere else, drop the weights there and over time you get back this network. So the question of course, we are on the biological side mainly in my lab. So is this how it actually works? And so this is something that Sang Su sought to experiment with, with a very particular kind of experiment where let's say that the flies uh, in a particular heading relative to this visual cue, this is where, let's say this is where the bump is right now. What if you optogenetically shift the bump to a different location? So suppose you can create activity in a different part of the ellipsoid body uh, EPG neuron population so that now you have a different relationship to the world and suppose you encode a different relationship. Can you remap essentially the, the world onto the fly, uh, onto the fly's compass? And so the way he could do this was to express both GCAMP, this calcium indicator, 
and something called crimson, um, you know, using two photon stimulation, he could image at the same time, and this is why he was imaging at low intensities, but he would excite just those populations optogenetically with two photon activation um, in a particular little square. So he could shift the bump by just, you know, hitting it harder with the two photon uh, laser intensity. So you'll see that video play in a loop, and so you'll see it again. So red is when it turns on, and you can see the bump almost instantly shifts to the new location. So now, imagine this, you're kind of going along in the world and suddenly someone kind of activates a different head direction population and you're all turned around and that's what we're doing to the fly. But the idea is to actually shift the representation to a different place. So now I'm gonna play, play you through a, an experiment where the fly initially starts out with a bump in a particular location. Let me start that again so that you can see. The bump is in this location relative to the scene and I'm gonna stabilize it at the end here. So there we go. So the black arrow indicates where the bump sits in the ellipsoid body relative to the visual scene at a particular location. Now, Sang Su is gonna go in and hard code in essentially through this optogenetic activation. So what he's doing is all he's activating is the compass neurons. The visual scene, the fly is doing whatever it's doing, but now he's activating it in such a way that he's trying to put in this optogenetic relationship now. The scene is in the exact same orientation as on the left, but for five minutes, he imposes a different relationship relative to the activity in the compass. Instead of 180 here, he's moved it 180 up there, okay? Now let's test it. Now we're back to no optogenetics, and what you see is that the bump shifts so that the relationship is very close to that 180 degrees. So again, you can look at the full range in, in, in the papers. There's more videos as well, which are fun. Um, but the bottom line is, if you look at the offset over time uh, before and after the optogenetic training, this is before, oops, this is before, so you can see uh, the orientation trace is the red, black, which you can barely see, but you can see it in the blue anyway, is the activity of the EPGs from, again, wedges one through 16 in a circle. Uh, there's a particular offset relationship. Sang Su flips it and makes it sort of 180 the opposite direction. And this is kind of what you get when you test. Okay, so the switch to look for is, this is below, this is above, okay? So if he does this time after time in many, many flies, what he gets is essentially points along the diagonal. This is the attempt, attempted shift amount. So this is how much he attempted to shift the offset of the world. So it's essentially like saying, I have a particular population of head direction cells that are active when I'm staring right at you, although I can't see you. Um, and then what Sang Su is doing is saying, no, let's have a population of cells that would otherwise be active when I'm fully turned around, active at the same time. And let's remap the world rotated by shifted by 180 degrees. And that works really well. Control flies without this particular optogenetic reagent. If you just go through the exact same protocol, nothing happens. It's a flat line over here, okay? So essentially you can remap uh, the world. What happens if there's competing landmarks? I mean, the natural situation where this might happen is, let's say you're in a situation first like this. So all is well with the world. You have a particular relationship to let's say a visual cue in the world. But now, for a brief while, you experience a different setup where there's now two cues, so it's confusing. But what's important here, and this is the interesting part, is not just that this is confusing and the bump might jump around between these two, but also that if you think about the way that the Hebbian network worked in, our, in the training protocol, well, in principle, what you should get then is both locations should be trained at the same time. So the one that has the bump active, let's say that it's locked to this set of the ring neurons that are active in this particular location. Well, at the same time, it just so happens that another set of ring neurons, 180 degrees opposite in their receptive field tuning are activated as well. And so if the rule works, you should essentially get both things being trained at the same time. And indeed, in a fraction of flies, what you get is a flip of the entire world. This is now no optogenetics. This is just two cues. And again, the key point is, what we've done here is, or what the fly has managed to do is uh, confuse itself essentially through a plasticity rule that encodes um, the, the correlated activity of both the bump, the EPG bump, the compass, and the visual neurons. And so you can literally flip it. And this is something that Yvette Fisher and Rachel Wilson's lab uh, showed in a paper that happened at the same time in walking flies. And so this is pretty robust that this happens uh, in a confusing setup. We further looked at it um, in, in a couple of different ways. So we also asked, oops, I don't know what that was. So we also asked, can we, you know, how much can we push the system? So here's a case where we can take a compass that is a perfectly normally behaving compass where the bump moves in the direction it's supposed to move. Um, so clockwise when it's supposed to move clockwise, but now Sang Su 
did the unfair thing of training the fly on a bump that moves in the opposite direction when the world moves. And then in the last few minutes of the talk, in case Daniela, this is relevant. So he's trained it now on the compass moving in the opposite direction to the world. Uh, and when he tests it, at least for a little while, indeed the compass is flipped. So this is a bad place to put the fly in maybe, but uh, it's just temporary and it gets back its normal mapping in time as, as the real mapping takes hold. Um, but for a short while, the fly has basically mapped the world inverted. So every time it turns this way, it thinks it's turning the other way, we would assume. Um, finally, in an experiment um, which Sung Su did, um, you know, this was something that uh, Anne and Sung Su had talked about, which was, you know, flies shouldn't need to actually turn 360 degrees to, to remap the whole world. I mean, typically you enter a room and you kind of quickly look around and you have the map in your head. Can a fly do that? And so the width of the bump in principle should allow for that. And so in this case, Sung Su just activated the bump for just a small number of degrees. So you could go, you know, as low as 90 degrees and he would just restrict the activity to just that much and try and see if the mapping then expanded to the rest of the world because of the way the ring attractor works. If the bump starts in the right place, will it just sort of figure out the rest by itself if you remap it? And indeed he could do that as well. So again, the experiment here is, let's say it starts with a particular mapping of the world. You now shift it in just a small part of the ellipsoid body and then that propagates over time to the rest. So you can remap quite quickly with only you know, partial exposure to the scene. You don't literally need to turn around a hundred times to get this kind of mapping. Again, this is unsupervised learning, right? There's no learning uh, happening other than co-activity of, of the bump and, and the scene. All right, so coming back to the navigational perspective then, what might all this mean? Um, I mean, basically we think this little network of neurons, you know, the entire central complex has a few thousand neurons. It's 2,876, I think to be precise, we now know from electron microscopy. Uh, it's not a lot of neurons, but with that set up in place, the fly does quite a bit on navigation and quite a bit with context dependent navigation. And so ultimately our goal is to kind of link um, behavior to the function of these networks through theory. And so we've been doing you know, quite a few experiments along these lines. Uh, I won't go into details. I specifically focus not on the behavior as much, but I'll just mention a couple of things. Like for example, where is you know, this kind of network used in the fly? We think one possible thing to explore is how it might be used for path integration, something that Irene Kim and Michael Dickinson's lab has shown flies do, as well as Axel Brockman's lab in NCBS. And the idea here is simple. There's a little food spot, in this case, a sugar spot. Let's say the fly wanders around looking for some food. It's hungry. Uh, it finds the spot. What happens next is uh, the fly will basically do this. If it's a tiny enough spot, do multiple little loops around it. The food's almost gone. It's looking for more, but it explores in this local way. It's a local search and it does this in pure pitch darkness. So it can do this with odorless food as well as it obviously with odors, it helps uh, to get there faster, but it can keep track, go around, kind of stumble around, come back in a loop, go far away and come back to that same spot. So there's a little centered search it can do. And as you look at uh, the trajectories that Hannah Habakkuk in the lab found, you can kind of see these gorgeous ones that come back to the same spot. So presumably you can keep track of both distance and its vector away from that central spot. So that's one example. And finally, I'll leave you with this gorgeous example of place learning that my colleague, Michael Reiser here, uh, a grad student in his lab, Tyler Ofstad did these experiments. It's the Morris water maze for the fly. Instead of a hidden platform, there's a cool spot. And what you're gonna see is that the fly over many trials learns to associate uh, the visual surroundings with the presence of that cool spot so that when the visual surroundings shift and the cool spot shifts with it, the fly is quicker at finding its way to that spot. So right now it's shifted, the flies run around. This is a sped up video, so don't think that they actually move that fast, um, but they find their way to that spot. Uh, it's, well, most of them find their way to the spot. Um, and so on and so forth. And they get there faster and faster. Some get there really fast, okay? So, all right, with that, I'm gonna thank all the people I, I work with. Um, it's a pleasure working with them. So it's not just my lab though. We depend hugely on collaborators like the wonderful anatomy work from Tanya Wolf's lab, uh, our theorist colleagues here and elsewhere uh, who have helped a lot in this work. And then of course, Janelia is a real network of people. Uh, loads of people have informed the work we do. I should mention again, or maybe I forgot to mention this, but uh, Yvette Fisher and Rachel Wilson had parallel work on the uh, you know, flexible mapping onto the ring and Gabby Memon's lab, Jonathan Green and Gabby Memon had parallel work on the angular velocity 
part of this, like the funky setup with the EPGs and the PENs and the recurrent loops. So this is an active field, which you know um, we have lots of conferences on. So please do come. Uh, there's all kinds of programs. Well, <laughs> don't come right now, but in general, please do visit. Uh, we'd love to have you. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Vivek, for an inspiring talk. There are plenty of questions. Uh, some of them have come up at the beginning, but I, I just uh, kept them for the end. So Dinesh is asking, uh, is referring, they are referring to the, the, the example with the two bars. Yeah. Uh, and so the question is, I find the flipping with the presence of two bars a bit weird. Doesn't naturalistic image contain multiple such bars? Won't it go haywire in a natural, in a natural image? No, so, so it's a good question, but no, because uh, in an actual image, in a natural scene, you have many, many different visual cues. And there's, I mean, this is part of Sun Tzu's paper, so I'll refer you to that for the details. But we actually played around with different kinds of 2D arrangements onto a screen. And as long as your autocorrelation function for the visual scene is single peaked, you're okay. The mapping is perfect. If it's multi-peaked and the other peaks compete with the first peak, in other words, you have symmetries in the scene, that's when you get into trouble. So if you put four bars kind of at equal points, uh, exactly the same elevation and at, it's equally spaced and azimuth, then you get into trouble. So if you put two bars like that, you get into trouble. But if you have a complex scene with many cues, there's usually a unique, a, a lovely single peak in the autocorrelation function and you're fine. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, Tom Burns had asked this uh, at the you know the very beginning of the talk. Is there any any is there much inter-animal variation in the EM reconstructions? I mean, we would love to know. So there's work from Stanley Heinze's group, um, and they are looking into uh, doing EM reconstructions uh, at a different resolution, but still in ants and in sweat bees. And um, so I think that you know the answer is definitely going to be yes. There's going to be a specialization to different ecological niches and different behavioral repertoires. I mean, ants are master path integrators, so presumably they have a more refined uh, way to do this. But I will say that it's early days in terms of figuring out how any network does it. So we're focused on the fly because of the genetic tools, but I would guess that as EM gets more you know, available for uh, larger and larger brains, we'll go to the bee, we'll go to the ant, get high resolution stacks of all those. And that's a very interesting thing to explore, how it's related to the ecological niche. Uh, Tiziano Dalbis has asked, uh, do you think uh, the circuits wires up via activity dependent process in the young animal or could it be, could they, could it be all genetically hardwired? Yeah. So my guess, I mean, this is, no, I'm clearly guessing. I think this is evolution that's done most of the work uh, and done the training for this network. And, and I think it is very, very much the case that the wiring is laid down. I mean, there are developmental, um, specialists working on this, Sum and Lee here, Chris Doe in, uh, in Oregon. Um, but it does look like it's developmentally hardwired in the sense that the morphology and the projection patterns are hardwired. Now, after that, there's plasticity in those connections. So once you've kind of got the basic framework, those things are plastic. And like you saw with the ring neuron to EPG connection. So it's not saying the network is laid down and it can't change its weights. It can, but the structure of the thing we think is, is genetically determined. It's developmental to a large extent. Um, so we do have a few questions stuck in the Q&A, and I have one myself, but I would like also to try something we've never tried before here uh, to the attendees. I think there may be room for one or two live questions. So Wonderful. if at this stage you want to raise your hands electronically, I might uh, give you the microphone at some point. But let me, as you, as you organize your thoughts, let me just get on with the questions that have been already asked through the Q&A. Um, so Dick is asking, uh, with no sensory inputs, one might expect a random walk uh, with random changes in directions. That this, does this model do that? Yeah, so just the, you know, how it diffuses, how it drifts around is something that we are very interested in and why it doesn't drift more is something that we're interested in. So uh, I'll say two things there. So I mentioned Marcella's uh, work to look at this from a theoretical standpoint, but even in a practical standpoint, I mean, we have looked at this. We have looked at what happens to the representation in darkness when the fly is on the ball. One challenge with looking at it experimentally is when the fly is on the ball, it's by far not its natural substrate, right? I mean, it's kind of on this thing where there's a particular relationship with a, a, a curved surface. Even if you use a larger diameter ball, it's still a curved surface. We are never certain a tethered fly with its head open on a ball 
um, is actually you know, a fair assessment of how much this bump actually drifts in darkness. We don't know what it would look like in flat ground. However, having said all that, um, there are some flies where the relationship is unbelievably good, where the bump really doesn't drift around. So we're looking into what mechanisms might enable this, why you have a very linear, um, you know, when you look at the integration, it's, it's super, it's very linear, not super linear, it's a very linear. Uh, and so the question is, how does it maintain that at low velocities? The only places we see dropping of, um, you know, the, the, the kind of relationship, locked on relationship, is actually when, let's say that I'm gonna mimic this, Let's say that my goal is to walk directly towards you, um, but instead I go something like this. So hopefully it's subtle, but you can detect it. So it's like I'm slightly off. On the ball, that's where we see the bump start to drift. But when it's standing still, often the fly will stop. The bump will kind of slowly drop down in amplitude. Fly resumes, but it resumes, the bump resumes in the same place. So it's actually remarkably good at not diffusing away. And so how that happens, we don't yet know. Thank you. So s somebody wants to speak, uh, but before we get to that, I would like just to ask a question myself. So from a modeler and let's say uh, uh, like a, a, a dynamicist point of view, there are two modes in which we typically study these patterns. One of them is under a stimulus, which I think it's mostly what, you, what we have seen here. But then we also often look at the network when there is no stimulus and in, in, in its ability to preserve the type of structures or perhaps to, to explain, you know, to, to display different type of structures that we don't see under a stimulus. Can you make some comments on that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the experiment I was referring to where it's in darkness standing on the ball, in some cases we get 35 seconds where the fly just happens to be standing there. It's in darkness and it's just standing on the ball. It's not turning, it's not doing anything and the bump sometimes will stay kind of alive through the 35 seconds. Sometimes it will drop in amplitude and seem to almost disappear at the resolution of our calcium indicators, but then pop back up in the same place. So it's not like it just sort of meanders around in, when, when there's in the absence of these stimuli. It's as if there's something keeping it locked in. Now, there's a whole another set of questions that you could ask, which are during sleep, where, you know, in, in mammals, Adrian Perash and others uh, have, have looked at this and asked, you know, what happens to head direction cells in sleep? And they preserve a lot of their relationships, but there's clearly some replay-like things that could happen. And in flies, we don't yet know that. So this is something that we might explore someday, but we don't yet know that. Okay. But that's, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Daniel. It does, it does, thank you. Um, so I want to uh, give the microphone to Dinesh in a moment. Before we do that, uh, Vivek, may, may I ask you to um, switch off the screen sharing for a moment sure. so that uh, this gets us ready for the next talk and we're going to be able yeah. to talk a little bit in the meantime. So, uh, Dinesh, uh, you're allowed to talk now. Please pose your question. Dinesh is figuring out the mute button. Hello. Hello. There you are. But now I can't see you, Dinesh. Uh, oh, my, I've taped my webcam, so I have to get another Hold one. Hold on. It's okay. Uh, uh, even you know how I look, so it's fine. So, uh, I have a, a, like a very interesting talk. So, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here, because it seems to be more than a simple head direction set. You're saying there is autocorrelation involved, which implies there's some higher order spatial structure, which is being mapped onto this. You said there's memory involved. It seems to uh, remember two images and, you know, point the same direction. Uh, it seems a lot more than, you know, just having your bearing right in a particular environment. What is going on here? I mean, what do you think in the big picture? I mean, I would love to know the answer myself, but no, uh, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I think that uh, the things I talked about with visual scenes being mapped using some kind of Hebbian rule onto this compass, that's still within the framework of a compass. It's just a compass that is flexible enough to work under you know, complex visual settings or just simple settings where there's just the sun or settings where there's maybe wind and uh, visual cues, different kinds of sensory cues. So it's essentially like, how do you maintain a robust, reliable estimate of direction given all the sensory cues and your own internal self motion uh, estimates like, you know, angular velocity. So that part we really do think is essentially a compass, but of course, I mean, given that evolution has structured this network in whatever way it has, um, I mean, we're, hoping to att basically attempt to answer your question through behavior, like expose the fly to different behavioral settings, different contexts, and essentially give the fly different challenges and then see what the network's doing and then maybe ferret out 
what these different neuron types are needed for. Why do you need all these different neurons? And this is only one tiny part of the network. The rest of the central complex we think does 2D stuff. So, you know, there's a whole space of possibilities for navigation there that we haven't touched. Okay. So, um, I think uh, what I suggest to do is that we, for the time being, thank Vivek for giving a uh, fantastic talk. Um, I just want to mention that the discussion may continue on Slack. Uh, uh, there is a channel that is dedicated I'll to this I'll be on panel. Slack. Yeah, I know the and channel. And in fact, I've, 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 you know, I've used Slack with Vivek just a, a few minutes before the conference. I will be there to answer and to take more questions. Um, for the time being, I would just want to, uh, to point out that at the moment, as you know, the conference was split in two. There is a channel one that is the present one and channel two where a, a parallel session on uh, dynamics and structured networks will start soon. In this, uh, in this channel, we're going to have a session on numerical methods. So once again, thank you, Vivek, and thank you thank all you. for taking part and enjoy the rest of ICMNS. Thank you all. Bye.